All right. This is uh, pretty big right here. This is this is big. This still was still right at the beginning of Unit 2 talking about Congress. Um, big part of Unit 2. Um, 2.3 card 2.3 we got two cards here so be ready with a couple um and on the front of this one congressional powers all right we're looking at enumerated powers versus implied powers remember we talked about this already this idea of enumerated or powers that are clearly written into the constitution versus implied powers which are powers that you need in order to carry out the enumerated powers but they're not necessarily obvious, and there's a debate over these implied powers. So let's take a look at those and uh, and to go from there. All right, cool. Here we go. Backside. First, on the back, uh, on the back of your index card, make a T chart. So make a T chart on the left hand side. Put enumerated on the right hand side. Put implied. Okay, so T chart enumerated implied. I'm going to run through these fairly quickly. So if you uh, have trouble keeping up with me, of course, as always pause when needed. All right, here we go. Enumerated powers. We're going to start with one, raising revenue. And when anytime you see the term revenue, think taxes. Raising revenue means raising taxes. All right, so uh, they have a they have that directly in Article 1, Section 8, clearly. I think I already showed you a quote from that earlier in a lesson. Regulate commerce. I already talked about that, specifically interstate commerce. Um, coin money. Declare war. All of these things are pretty commonly known that, that Congress has the power to do. Uh, the federal budget. All the departments, the military, all of those things are set forth in a budget passed by Congress. They can be vetoed by the, vetoed by the president, of course. Um, maintaining the armed services. Back then, it was really the Army and the Navy. Um, that has expanded, of course, to include an Air Force. All right. Implied powers. Um, so implied powers we already spoke about in the last unit, but we mean the necessary and proper clause, also known as the elastic clause, because Congress will stretch it out in order to gain more power to regulate different aspects of society, which they've done. And the Supreme Court, for the most part, has acquiesced in their desire to um, expand Congress's power here in the last 100 years or so. So necessary and proper clause, the elastic clause. Um, and then also, they, because of the necessary and proper clause, Congress has been able to enact legislation. Just think policy, okay? Anything that has to do with how we are regulated in life or fixes some sort of problem, that's called policy. And this, they get to enact legislation addressing a wide range of issues as a result of that. And those include um, economic issues. They include, include environmental issues. I think we already talked about the EPA a little bit or the Clean Air Act anyway, and then different social issues. So all of these things are a result in a lot of the legislation passed is implied power. It's not actual power written out in the Constitution like the things on the left-hand side. And those have happened as a result of uh, using the Necessary and Proper Clause or the Commerce Clause, actually. All right, awesome. That's entirely that card. Now we're moving on to the next one. So go ahead and grab another card. All right, um, and I wanted to talk about one of the powers that Congress has. It is definitely an enumerated power. I didn't have it in the list. There are more than those powers in the list, but those are the big ones. But I want to talk about one enumerated power really quickly. I spoke about it when I talked about the House and the Senate, and I wanted to just mention it here, and that is um, impeachment. All right, 2.4, impeachment. Let me get a little bit more detail on that just so you understand it. All right, um, one, impeachment is a check on the executive and the judicial branches. A judge or federal judge can be impeached by the president and uh, by the Congress, and also the president can be impeached by Congress. That's probably fairly obvious. There have been three presidents who've been formally impeached, and that was Andrew Johnson after the Civil War, and he was one short, one vote short of being convicted and removed from office. Of course, um, and a second president was not Nixon. Okay, a lot of people think of Nixon. Nixon actually resigned prior to being. Um, impeached. He would have been impeached and likely convicted. So he resigned um, rather than do, have that happen. The second president was, was Bill Clinton, who was um, impeached over a sexual harassment suit that he was sued um, and accused of sexual harassment. And then he lied under oath when they were doing a deposition on that. And so the lying under oath kind of became a, the issue and he got impeached, was not convicted. And then President Trump was uh, more recently uh 
impeached over a phone call he had with Ukraine. And it seemed like in the, in the call, maybe he was doing some sort of quid pro quo, like you do this, I do that. And, and, and perhaps that was violating a congressional act. The Democrats in the Congress, um, in, in the House charged him with impeachment. And then he was uh, acquitted in the Senate, which was run by Republicans. All right. So, um, and you, you, why do you get impeached? Well, in the constitution, it says that you get impeached for treason, bribery, that'd be obvious, right? And other high crimes and misdemeanors. And of course, the the old other high crimes and misdemeanors, what exactly do the founders intend with that? And that's up to some interpretation, of course. All right, treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, one thing that I'll say, and, and we, we see this in the Federalist Papers, we're not going to read the Federalist Papers in terms of impeachment, but in the Federalist Papers, there is the point that uh, Madison and Jay and, and Hamilton make that it's not necessarily for maladministration. And maladministration is just a nice way of saying like crappy presidents. Like you weren't going to be impeached just for being you know, a terrible president. Um, there may be partisan pushes for that. Um, I think one could make the argument that um, the Republicans in Clinton and then the Democrats with Trump – Maybe their motivation was that they thought the uh, the president was bad, so therefore they had to come up with a reason to impeach them. But um, you know, some some could argue that. But at the same time, like just being a crappy president, you know, you know James Buchanan prior to the Civil War was like probably the worst president in our history. I mean, he didn't get impeached for it. Um, he just was terrible. And so here's how it works: the House impeaches, and they charge. Remember, this is basically a charge. Um, you're charging the person with a with some sort of um misdemeanor or some sort of problem. It doesn't have to necessarily be a crime, although there's interpretation that it has to be a crime. Um, but they impeach, and it's just a 50, 50% plus one vote. 50% plus one means a majority. Just means you get 50%, and then you get one extra vote above 50%, and boom, guess what? You got it. So this is a, it's actually fairly easy to impeach a president in that regard, or a judge. But here's where the rubber meets the road, and that's in the Senate, because the Senate holds a trial. And it takes 67% to convict, all right, 67% to convict in the Senate. And the only punishment that the Senate can do is removal from office. Now, if a president like committed some sort of crime, like murder, let's say, uh, then the House could impeach, the president, the, the Senate would convict, they'd be removed from office, and then the locality where the crime was committed would then be able to prosecute the president um, for the criminal side. So the Senate and the House are not doing the criminal trial. This is a political trial. Let's be clear about that. This is political. But then it, they are then eligible to be um, convicted of a crime once they're um, out of office. It, Nixon, uh, for example, could have been uh, uh, tried or, or charged with you know ruining an investigation or, or obstructing justice of an investigation. But uh, President Ford, his vice president when he became president – ended up um, giving him, uh, commuting that, and so he was pardoned, and so he didn't have to do that, which probably was not a very popular um, thing by the American people that he pardoned him. But Ford thought it would be an embarrassment to have a president um, actually you know, put in prison, so he pardoned Nixon. All right, cool. That's impeachment, and those are the, um, the powers enumerated and implied powers of Congress. Study them. You will need to know them well, as always. Thank you.